Hi guys, in this video we are going to be learning about coastal geomorphological processes. This will involve understanding the processes of marine erosion and marine transportation and finishing with an exam style question. To begin with, we're going to look at coastal geomorphological processes in a bit of a wider viewpoint. And overall, these processes are driven by an input of energy. And these energy tends to come from either the water, through the waves, or from wind. And these processes tend to change the characteristic of the components of the coastal landscape, such as the shape of the beach or the cliffs and other geomorphological features that we have, such as sand dunes as well. So as I said before, these processes can either come from the water, so they're called marine processes, or what are called sub-aerial processes, and these are the ones that operate on the land but shape the coastline, such as weathering, runoff and mass movement, whereas our marine processes operate on the coastline via the sea through things like waves, tides and longshore drift. And we're going to look at the different marine and sub-aerial processes within this video. Firstly, we're going to look at processes of marine erosion, and these are the ones that are caused by the sea through waves, tides and currents. So firstly, looking at coastline erosion, we're just going to look at some different types of marine erosion now, starting with hydraulic action. And what hydraulic action is, is simply the force or the impact of the water on rocks. So it's just the pressure when the waves hit the rocks, and this can help to weaken the surface of the rocks. Then we have a process called wave quarrying. And this is when a breaking wave moving towards a cliff face there's air which gets trapped in the gaps in the rock and it's kind of the air is forced into the rock by the wave which is pushing and trapping the air inside the rock and then when the water then pulls back it's almost like a vacuum an explosive effect happens as the air is released from where it's trapped within the rock and explosive effect can tend to weaken the rock itself and cause weathering so causing the rock to degrade and break down our next process is called abrasion or also called corrasion and this is when material that's carried within the sea wears away the rock faces so things like sand shingle which is like timber or wood that's in the water and bigger boulders carried by the water simply they hit against the rock and wear away the surface of the rock when they're washed upon the beach by waves and so on so it's a very much like a scraping effect which wears down the rock when it's being hit by these materials. Then we have attrition and this is the rocks in the sea carrying out erosion such as the sand and the boulders we were just talking about and when they hit into each other and when they hit onto bigger rocks um, on the coastline they themselves are worn down into smaller rounded pieces so attrition is the breakdown of the materials that are carrying out abrasion that we just looked at. And finally, we have solution. And solution is mostly relating to the dissolving of calcium-based rocks in areas where we get fresh water mixing with seawater. Fresh water can be slightly acidic. We know that we learned in previous videos that seawater is actually very alkaline. But in areas where fresh water meets the seawater, it can be slightly acidic and this acid can dissolve the calcium-based rocks, such as limestone, that we get along a lot of coastlines. And another type of solution relates to salt evaporation. Sometimes when water evaporates, salt is left in the cracks in the rock. And then when this rock can be heated up during the day, these crystals expand and the pressure of the crystal expanding can also cause stress in the rock and cause it to crack. And now we're going to look at some of the factors that might affect the rate of coastal erosion, so how quickly or how slowly the erosion is occurring. So the first factor is the wave steepness and breaking point of waves, because waves that are steeper, can you imagine if a wave is really high and tall compared to a wave that's really kind of quite shallow, these waves have much higher energy, so you're going to have a greater erosive power on the rocks. 
and also waves that are breaking at the foot of the cliff are going to release more energy, almost like a big punch on the rocks, whereas a wave that breaks further away in the sea is obviously not going to have much energy by the time it reaches the foot of the cliff, therefore the erosion is going to be a lot weaker. Then we have fetch. We learned about fetch before and fetch relates to how far a wave has travelled over the ocean and usually the longer a wave has travelled the more energy it's going to have because the energy hasn't been kind of diluted by hitting into other obstacles. So this will determine how much energy the wave has generated if it's travelled over a longer distance and, and a wave that has more energy is going to have greater erosive power. And then the next factor we have is sea depth and effectively where we have a steeply shelving seabed which means that the seabed, if I draw a little diagram here, dips off and becomes very deep very quickly from the coastline, this is going to create higher and steeper waves. Whereas if the coastline has a more kind of gradual incline, the waves are going to lose their energy much further away from the coastline at around this point in comparison to this point if it's a much steeper seabed because of increased friction further away. So if the sea is deeper closer to the coastline we're here we're going to get higher and steeper waves and therefore they're going to have a greater erosive power. And then we have coastal configuration. So where we have headlands, which we learnt about before when we learnt about wave refraction. So if we have a coastline which has a piece of headland like this, the headland is going to be subject to greater erosion because the waves are hitting it first compared to the beaches around here, which will receive weaker waves. So headlands are attracting wave energy through refraction. The next factor we have is beach presence and beaches absorb wave energy and in this sense this means they provide protection against marine erosion because of absorbing wave energy they are areas of deposition. So beaches are accumulations of things like sand and shingle that are deposited and this is because the beaches absorb the wave energy, so the waves lose energy and therefore have to deposit material. And we can also get steep and flat beaches depending on the type of materials. So sand usually creates very flat beaches and shingle, which is kind of larger pebbles, tends to create steeper beaches. And we're going to learn more about beaches and their formation in another video. And then lastly, we have human activity and humans can protect coastal environments by erecting sea defences. These tend to reduce erosion in a specific area, but as a side effect, they can increase erosion elsewhere. And also humans can negatively affect beach environments by removing protective materials such as sand and shingle and this can cause increased beach erosion. The next factor we're going to look at in terms of marine erosion is the geology of an area and this means the kind of characteristics or the rocks or the type of rocks within a specific coastal environment and this can also be referred to as the lithology and the lithology relates to the characteristics of the rocks whereas geology more relates to the type of rock. So lithology affects the resistance to erosion as if the rocks are aligned in certain positions this can either make them more or less resistant to erosion. Also we need to take into account permeability. Some rocks are more permeable than others and this is about the amount of water that can seep through. So less permeable rocks means that water cannot penetrate it whereas more permeable rocks water can seep through. And the more resistant rocks that we have are things like granite and chalk, whereas the less resistant types are rocks like clay. And these dissolve very readily and therefore are less resistant to erosion. Also, the factor of jointed rocks. This is rocks that have jointed bedding planes. So it's not just one mass of rock. If you draw it here, such as limestone, they have bedding planes, which means they have natural kind of fractures within the rocks. And at these fractures, they are less resistant to erosion. So often we get big chunks of rock 
breaking off at these bedding planes. And all these factors that we've just learned about here show that we have differential rates of erosion, which simply means that we have a variation in the rates of erosion in different types of rocks due to their characteristics. So the structure of rocks also has a significant impact on rates of erosion and transportation. So using the example of this map of the Purbeck coast in southern England, as we can see on this map here, the structure of the rocks also affects the rate of erosion. And here, this is because when rocks, as shown by these different types of rocks, here we've got limestone, clay and sands, and hard chalk. These produce a very different type of coastline when they lie at a right angle. So this is a very basic right angle to the coast. So the southern part of the coast, as we can see along here with this limestone section, here the rocks are known as concordant, which means they run parallel to the coastline. As you can see, it's almost pretty much straight at the bottom facing south. And here the very resistant hard limestone forms cliffs and these protect the coast from erosion and only really allow the sea to break through in a few places such as this bay area here which erodes into the clay behind and clay is much softer so here we can see that in softer areas we get these bays forming whereas in these harder areas we have um, more cliff formation so this just shows you how the different structure of rocks can affect the shape of the coastline because where it's softer we have greater erosion and we get these kind of bays and estuaries forming. And in this area, we call this a discordant coastline in comparison to our concordant coastline. Here, as you can see, they look very different. And this is due to, most importantly, the structure of the rocks, with there being a harder type of rock here and softer rock here, allowing greater erosion. The dip of the rock is also a major factor to do with coastline erosion and the steepest cliffs tend to form from rocks that have a horizontal strata. Strata means the bedding planes of rocks, so rocks that are lying horizontally like this, we get the steepest cliffs and also those that dip gently inland, which means that they kind of dip in this direction. Whereas the more gentle features on our coastlines, not like cliffs. Cliffs have very sharp edges like this. They have strata or bedding planes that tend to dip towards the coastline. And I'm going to show you in some diagrams here. So where we get our steeper cliffs, as I said, we have rocks with very like horizontal bedding planes, but also ones that dip towards the inland in this direction, as you can see. Whereas where we have more gentle features, this is where we get rocks that have a dip which are heading away from the coastline, so in this direction. So the gentler the slope of the bedding plane of the rock, the gentler the feature, as you can see, the angle of this is much lower and therefore we're getting a very more gentle feature. Now finally we're going to look at processes of marine transportation and these are very similar to processes of transportation in river environments and they're pretty much the same. So we have these four different types of transportation known as traction, saltation, suspension and solution. And to give you a brief overview of these different types of transportation, traction is large boulders being rolled across the surface, as you can see in this diagram here. Saltation is slightly smaller things like pebbles, which are jumping or hopping across the surface. Suspension is very much smaller particles like clays and silts, which are totally suspended in the water. So they're not coming into contact with the bed, they're simply floating so you can think of suspension as floating and then solution is any particles so very small particles that are actually dissolved in the water 
So those are our types of marine transportation and they're very much the same for transportation in rivers. But there is one important type of transportation that we're going to look at which is called longshore drift which will come into play in later videos as it can develop many coastal landforms such as spits which we're going to look at in a later video. And longshore drift occurs when we have waves hitting the coastline in a non kind of parallel direction. So typically the wind would approach the shoreline in this direction. So therefore we'd have the waves moving towards the land in this direction and the waves pulling back. But when we have waves or wind hitting the shoreline in this direction, so this means that, that the waves are also going to be hitting the coast at an angle as shown here. So when the waves hit at an angle, their swash and their backwash still moves backwards into the ocean. So this is pulling back any material from this area of erosion and drawing it back and it's then transporting it further along the coastline and this is longshore drift. So we have the wave hitting at an angle, pulling back, removing sediment from the beach such as sand and the sand is then being transported along the beach in the direction of prevailing wind and this happens over and over again and eventually material is moved along the beach and this is longshore drift. So just to go over that again, we have the waves hitting at an angle, the backwash pulling material back off the beach and then the waves are transporting it back onto the beach further down and the process occurs over and over again. So all the material down here is eventually going to be transported down here. And we have special features that can be used to prevent longshore drift, which are called groins. And groins are these features that we can see along this beach here. So groins, they prevent longshore drift by reducing the sediment that can be transported down the beach. So it's confined within these areas. So where we have the waves approaching at an angle, then they draw back the sediment can only be moved down as far as here. So you can see on the groins, we have a buildup of sediment and sand on this side and it's being deposited on this side and eroded from this side. But these groins prevent longshore drift from occurring. So it stays within these areas. So we don't have the coast kind of moving along and all the sand being removed from this part of the beach and being moved down here. These groins prevent that from happening. So now we're going to answer an exam style question and this is a more mathematical question but I'm going to talk you through it and it's going to be a lot easier than it looks. So the question asks us to complete the figure and interpret the chi-squared result using figure 2. So figure 1 shows data relating to coastal flooding in Great Britain. The investigation is trying to determine whether any stretch of the coastline is more or less susceptible to coastal flooding. The 96 most severe floods have been analysed. And the null hypothesis is that there is no significant difference in the location of the worst floods to affect Great Britain. And in our table, O stands for observed frequencies and E stands for expected frequencies. So of this six mark question, three marks are coming from filling in this table. So here we have our O and our E figures. And the bits that we're being asked to fill in is this box here, this box here, and this box here. So these are three marks that we are going to get for out of our six total marks. So we need to fill in these boxes. So we have our different regions of the coast and our observed frequencies and our expected frequencies. And we're going to be calculating the chi-squared result, which is this result here through this formula. So for the southwest, we'll start with, we need to work out what is O minus E squared. So we have our O figure our E figure, O minus E, which is 14. And then we need to work out what 14 squared is. So this answer is going to be 14 squared, which is equal to 196. And then for the northeast, we're being asked to work out what is the O minus E squared value divided by E. So we've already got our O minus E squared value here, which is 64. And we need to divide 64 by E for this northeast region, which is 24. So it's going to be 
64 divided by 24, which is equal to 2.6. So we can fill in this box with 2.6. And now we're going to work out our chi-squared value, which is this x squared here. And this is the total of all these figures added up together. So it's going to be 0 0.17 plus 2.6 plus 8.17 plus 0.67, which gives us a total of 11.61. So that is our x squared value, 11.61. So those are three marks that we've now gained out of the six mark question. And now to get our final three marks, we need to use this chi-squared figure and analyze it to talk about the significance level of the null hypothesis above of the study, which was that there is no significant difference in the location of the worst floods to affect Great Britain. So now we need to analyze our data on the chi-squared figure that we've interpreted with these degrees of freedom and the significance level and simply going to state in our analysis with three marks that the chi-squared figure of 11.61s exceeds both the 0.05 and 0.1 significance levels. So these are our significance levels 7.82 and 11.34 and obviously 11.61 is greater than these values so we can say it exceeds our significance levels. That's the first thing you want to do. You want to state whether it's greater or smaller or in between these values. And in this case, it's greater than. So we can say it exceeds both these significant levels of 0.05 and 0.1. And then we can say that this means that the null hypothesis can be rejected. So if our figures are tend to be greater than the significance levels, this means the null hypothesis we were given at the beginning is false and we can then reject the hypothesis and this suggests that there is a significant difference because our null hypothesis has said that there wasn't a significant difference if we reject the hypothesis that means there was a significant difference in the location of the worst floods to affect great britain so this is the first mark the second mark of our analysis and the third mark we can say that from the data, it is evident that flooding is more likely to affect the southwest compared to other locations. We could do this by looking at our table and we can see that the figure here is 8.17. So the southwest is more significantly affected. So it's all about using the data to provide this analysis. So those are our three marks for this question. So it's very easy if we get the three marks right at the beginning from filling in the table, then it's a really quick and easy three mark analysis to get all six marks. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level geography resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. See you soon and together let's make A-level geography a walk in the park.